chose a quite a large chunk of scripture um, because I wanted to really look at the topic as a whole. And I think this part of scripture really deals with what justification is and also what faith is and does so in, in, a, in a marvelous way that really gives us a great picture of this truth, of this topic. And so hopefully I live up to, to Hilda's uh, words and describing this and explaining it well enough for you. Um, it, it, it's justification by faith alone is really the summation of the gospel itself. It really deals with all of the things that we've been talking about. We've been talking about the nature of God, who he is, what he does, the nature of man, and how original sin affected all of humanity and how we are dead in our sin with no ability whatsoever uh, in our salvation. And then we talked about the person of Jesus, the work of Jesus, um, and that's central to justification. Um, and then we talked about the new birth and, and also God's grace, what that is. And this really justification really looks at all of those. It looks at God as judge. God is, is who he is in nature, being holy, being the judge of sin, and also looking at how we get this justification. And we get it through Christ and Christ alone. And then what is faith? It, it's, it's, it's what we do, but at the same time it's what we cannot do. It's a gift from God. And, and so all these pieces really describe what justification is. And it's been said many, many times throughout history, especially in the Reformation and in, in that area, um, justification by faith alone is a, a pillar of the church. So if you think about a building and how the building is structured and it stands, if you knock out one of those pillars, the building falls. The building crumbles. And this is a truth that this is what it is, that when we come to Scripture and see what justification by faith alone is and we hold it strong, we stand firm on it, and we proclaim it in full truth, then the church is the strongest. The church is is, is, it has strength to bear against many, many false teachings that twist a lot of these pieces. But when it is distorted, when it is changed, when it is, um, is just taken apart, the building crumbles. And Martin Luther, John Calvin, these guys proclaim this truth that if you take away justification by faith alone in any section of this, the church falls, Christianity falls. And so... This is where we come to, to being humble about this and, and what this really is because this is a serious truth to talk about. And we need to be honest with it. It is a dividing line in Scripture that we see, but we also need to be, to be humble um, about what this really means um, and proclaim it for what it is. So we're going to walk through this Scripture. I'm not going to read it in the beginning, we're going to read it chunk by chunk, and we're just going to kind of touch on some main parts of each section of this. So, again, it's 1760 um, in, in your pew Bibles, and we're going to start, and we're going to read um, verses 30 through 33 in the end of chapter 9. And Paul says this, he says, What then shall we say, that the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it, a righteousness that is by faith? But Israel, who pursued a law of righteousness, has not attained it. Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were, as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, See, I lay in Zion a stone that causes men to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. And the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. So here we see, here we start to see the context of what we're looking at. And so as we get into chapter 10, this really builds our framework of the subject that Paul is talking about. He's really juxtaposing two different belief systems, two different religions. You have a religion of righteousness by the law, and you have, have a religion of righteousness by faith. And, and he's really... Um, opposing these two. And so as we're walking through this, we see this word righteousness constantly. We see this word righteousness all throughout this. Uh, 
out of, the, out of this passage that we're going to look at. And it is really the concept of being justified, justification. This is really, in a lot of ways, a synonym for this. And, and so what is righteousness? What, uh, what are they talking about when they use this word? Righteousness is, is something that God is the source of. He is the author of. Um, so this is a righteousness that comes from God. Um, this is a divine righteousness, a righteousness that is given to people. Um, it, more specifically, it is a judicial verdict, a judicial approval, a verdict of approval from God. So it's, it's, it's God approving, a divine approval of someone. Um, it refers to what is deemed right by the Lord after his examination, what is approved in his eyes. Another word for this is justness. So you, you think of a judge. You think of a judge sitting up there, and he has a trial in front of him, and he is judging this trial. And to be, to be deemed right, to be right before that judge, that judge declares you right. So justification is, is very different from sanctification. It's very different from a lot of the other components in salvation. Justification is a declaration of God on somebody to declare them right, to declare them just, to declare them as if they had never sinned before. Um, so it is to, to be perfect in his sight. Um, so that really gives us a framework, first of all, of what justification is, and second of all, our our situation in 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 this what what we do what our responsibility is because when we see that it's him declaring us right before him that should automatically bring us to the truth that we have nothing to do with this that he is the one that declares it and if i have anything to do with that then that really destroys so much of of him being judge and everything else of it so is really a declaration by God on a human declaring them right before a righteous, holy judge. So that is the concept of what justification is, and we really see this in, in, this, in the word righteousness throughout here. So um, we're looking here at the beginning of these verses, and we're seeing the framework that Paul is now describing, that here's two belief systems. You have the Israelites who, who believed that they could merit their salvation, that they could do all of these works to gain favor from God. And he's saying that's, that's not it at all. That's not what true religion is. It's by faith that we have this righteousness, and it's not what we do. And he even describes this even further in citing Old Testament passages and saying, See, I lay a, uh, in Zion a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. The one who trusts in him, so him, Jesus, he is the stumbling stone. So he is the one who, who, um, who is righteous before God, who lives this sinless life that we need. He is that righteousness that stumbles because we as human beings want to feel like we can do something to gain his approval, that we are righteous in ourselves, whether it's 1% or whether it's 100%. And so here is this picture that, that Jesus is the stumbling stone because he is the righteous one. We are not. We cannot do anything. So we need his righteousness to stand before God and to be accepted by God. So this is really the framework of, of leading in to, to more of what Paul is talking about about righteousness by faith or justification by faith. Um, and so we continue on, and, and we read here in, in chapter 10, in verse 1, he says, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge, since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought their, to establish their own. They did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the end of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Now here, this is Paul really bearing his heart, opening his heart, and, and discerning what's going on in, in, in the Israelites and what they believed. And 
he loves them dearly. And so he's crying out and he's saying, my desire is for them to be saved. My prayer to God is for them to be saved. Um, so he's using a lot of discernment on, on the situation. And he says basically that they have a zeal for God. They have a zeal for the monotheistic God of the Old Testament. They have the correct God, but yet they have a distorted, uh, distorted view of what righteousness is how someone comes to be right before God. Um, so it's, it's completely distorted, and it's based on lack of knowledge. They're ignorant about this righteousness that comes from God. They do not know it. Um, and so you have this people group who, who believes something contrary to what salvation and what justification by faith alone really is. Um, and he, he says the reason for this because they do not know the righteousness that comes from God. Um, and what we saw earlier is that context that really helps us understand that this is what it's talking about, this righteousness that comes from God. And, and so they, they sought to establish their own righteousness and didn't submit to God's righteousness. So they set up um, in ways that where they, they thought that they could do various things to be in favor with God, to be approved by God, to be in relationship with God. And that is something that all throughout history we need to really look at because here we have a very clear line of division in Scripture between belief and unbelief. And what is really going on? What's at the base of this? And it's really based all around what the doctrine of justification by faith alone is. And the lack of understanding what that really is and believing something contrary. And so here we need to really discern what is at the root of this. Um, and in 4 he lines up and he says, Christ is the end of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. So categorically, these are people, everyone believing this is the righteousness for them, that Christ was the end of the law. He abolished the law by dying on the cross and rising again so he can give his righteousness to his people. Um, and there is, no, there is no righteousness of the law. There was none in the first place. And now that he came to bring in the new covenant, it is his righteousness. And that is the end of the law. And he gives this to people who believe. Um, these are all categorically people who, who he saved on the cross. And so here's a great testimony to what, to how we get this righteousness and how it lines up with, with what we cannot do um, as people, as natural people who want to be able to, to bring something to God. Natural people want to do that. We want to feel like we can, we can gain favor from God. And Scripture says that we have no ability we are dead in our sin. We are in the grave. We need to be raised from the dead. We need a new heart. We have a heart that, that cannot obey the law. Obey the law. We cannot. We don't want to. We don't want anything to do with God. And so this is a very clear picture of the righteousness that we need. And it's a righteousness that Christ gives us. And so he continues on and, and he says, Moses describes in this way the righteousness that is by the law. The man who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend into, into the deep, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we are proclaiming. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now here, it, here's another chunk where, where Paul is, is using Moses and using the Old Testament testimony of lining the two up. And he's really saying that Moses was proclaiming the, the word of faith. 
He was proclaiming the gospel. He was lining up the righteousness by the law and righteousness by faith. And he's, um, Paul is citing uh, Deuteronomy 30, verses 12 and 14. And what's interesting is here he's giving a, a negative and a positive. He's giving a, a who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep and bring Christ up. And he's really basically putting out there that, that it's not anything that we do. We can't do anything to, to gain our salvation in any way. But Christ has come down from heaven in human nature, fulfilled the law by his obedience, and died. And he was risen from the depths, the grave, for our justification. And so he's continuing on and, and making it even more clear by using these positive and negative and citing the Old Testament to line up really what all this is about. Um, and this is a, a great, great truth that we see. And he's also, it's interesting, you look at Deuteronomy 30, and you look at before it, and here's evidence that, that Moses was proclaiming what the gospel is. Uh, verse 30, or chapter 30, verse 6, it says, The Lord will circumcise your heart so that you will love the Lord with all your heart and soul that you may live. That's the gospel in itself. That's God's work in bringing and giving a new heart to a dead sinner. And Moses was proclaiming this. And so this is a great testament um, to what justification by faith alone is. And, and Paul continues. And notice, it's very interesting, you see in verse 9 and 10. Very interesting, the order. So in verse 8, he says, the word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. And here he's citing Moses. And so he continues on in verse 9. He says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now here he has confession and belief. So he has confession coming first, first and belief coming second. Notice what he does in verse 10. He flips them. He says, For it is with the heart you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. So here Paul is, is giving a deeper explanation of how this actually happens. And when we see the word for in a lot of Paul's writing, you could basically replace it with the word because. So if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that, get, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved because it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. And here's really the answer to all of this. This is such a, a beautiful picture of how someone comes to be saved. Can we really believe with our heart? Can we really believe with our heart as natural human beings? Now here is what is at the root of the belief that was contrary to what the gospel was, what the gospel is. Can you truly believe with your heart? And is that something that you're supposed to do? Is your salvation contingent on believing? This is very, very applicable to today in looking at what this really means. Can we truly believe with our heart? And if we do, then by our belief, are we justified? And it is with your mouth that you confess. It's confessing the same thing that God says about his son, about sin, about, uh, about all what the gospel proclaims. And so confessing your mouth that Jesus is Lord, there is so much to that statement that really there's so many parts of the gospel in that little statement itself um, that really apply to so many things throughout history that have come up as issues within the church. So here you have a great answer to how someone is saved. And he continues further in, in building this argument and he says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. And here he's, he's talking about the expansion of the gospel to the Gentiles, how it is including them now. So it, it is a great picture of God's plan to redeem a nation for himself, to bring two nations together, and to have a people for himself. No one will ever be put to shame 
who calls on the name of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It's interesting, Paul doesn't stay there. Paul, I love how Paul writes because he's really an apologist. He writes apologetically. He writes defending the truth. And you see him building his argument constantly. And so here, here's the, here's the natural question that arises from when he says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Natural question, okay. How then can they call on him, call on the one they have not believed in? So here he goes into more of his argument. And we'll read this section and we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit. He says, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have never have they have not heard and how can they hear without someone preaching to them and how can they preach unless they are sent as it is written how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news but not all the Israelites accepted the good news for Isaiah says Lord who has believed our message consequently faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word about Christ it's interesting to, to, to study this passage and go backwards. So let's look at this. Somebody needs to be sent. Somebody needs to be sent to do what? Somebody needs to be sent to preach the gospel. They need to be sent by God to preach the gospel. What is preaching the gospel? You can preach the gospel one-on-one -on -one to somebody. You can preach the gospel from the pulpit. You can preach the gospel in the park. You can preach the gospel in so many ways. And God preaches the gospel through his word that's living and active. And so someone needs to be sent. Someone needs to preach. And someone needs to hear. Someone needs to hear the truth of the gospel. The contents of what the gospel is. That gospel message that, that brings people to life. And so they need to hear it. Then they need to believe that truth. They need to believe and agree with all the content of that truth. They need to assent to it and say, I agree, amen, this is what I believe in. So they believe in the truth of the gospel. And then they call on him in faith. This calling is this believing, this having faith, this saving faith. And so it's great to see this order, and it really gives us a picture of conversion. How does God save? Well, here's a great, clear picture from Paul. This is how God saves people. This is how God saves people in the new covenant, giving them the Holy Spirit, bringing them to life. It's an amazing, amazing passage and how Paul just clearly lays it out and builds it up and answers the question. And then he says this, but not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? And why didn't they believe? What was the reason why they didn't believe? What's the answer to that? Paul gives us this answer. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message. But I thought faith was something that you bring to the table. I thought faith was something that you contribute to your salvation. Faith comes from hearing the gospel. The gospel are, is the words of eternal life, the words of spirit, the words of life from Jesus himself who proclaim this truth. It's, it's living and active. It changes a person. That is the gospel. Faith comes from hearing this gospel. It's how God saves somebody. And the proclamation of this gospel and using people like us. You are used by God to proclaim the gospel, and God saves people through you. Have you ever thought of that? Have you ever thought about what that is and the means that he uses to save people? It's a humbling experience. It's a humbling thing to think about. That the Almighty Creator uses us to proclaim the gospel and bring life to people. Wow. And we don't deserve that by any means. So faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word about Christ. Paul wraps it up beautifully. And that's where we wrap it up beautifully here, of looking at what the gospel is. We're going to look at next two weeks from now, 
what the what the summons is, what the what the command of the gospel is to believe and repent. But here, Paul beautifully says the message is heard through the word about Christ. Where do we go for this message? We go to Jesus' life and what he taught, what he taught in John 6. Go study that passage, verses 25 through 71. He lays the gospel out. What does he say in John 8? What does he say in John 3? What does he say in John 10? What does he say throughout all the gospels about what the gospel is? What an amazing picture. And this is the gospel that brings sinners to life. And so here, God uses this message to bring about a new birth. And it's by the work of Christ that we are given this righteousness and we stand justified before a holy and righteous God. We stand declared righteous by the God of creation. He says, I accept you. I approve of you. And it's not by what you did, it's by what my son did. I see my son. I see his righteousness, because his righteousness is given to you. It's an alien righteousness, a righteousness that is divine, that's given to us. And he declares us just, just as if I've never sinned before. Perfect, blameless, with no blemish, no spot, completely holy. We are declared right before him. It's an amazing truth. Amazing truth when we see the components of what justification by faith alone is. We need to proclaim this truth today boldly. We need to see where these lines of division are in Scripture and define this clearly in our day. Let's pray. Lord, you are are a marvelous, creative God who devised this plan that none of us could ever conjure up by any means, in any way. You sent your Son to die on a cross and to die perfectly, to die a a perfect death, to be that perfect sacrifice, and to live that perfect life for us, that righteous life, life that we desperately need. And through that work on the cross and you raising him from the dead, you bring justification, you bring righteousness to somebody, and you declare them right before you. That is a work that's all you, none of us, We are dead in our grave because of the sin of Adam and how we sinned in him. We need this truth. We need your declaration upon us to be right before God, and it's a work of you alone. We glorify you for that truth that has held the church through ages. The church stands on this truth. Let us stand on it in our day, firmly and boldly. Pray these things in your glorious name. Amen. So now we will sing our song of response. We'll do page 552 in your hymnal.